Okay, today we are talking about section 6.5, inverse trigonometric functions. The goal is to use uh, inverse trig functions to help us solve equations. So I've got a, a, a quick review of what a function is. Can you guys see that okay? Do I need to make it bigger? That's okay? Okay. Uh, recall a function can be thought of as a set of ordered pairs, inputs and outputs. Uh, w when you think of ordered pairs, think of inputs and outputs. The input being the first coordinate, the output being the second coordinate. So a function can be thought of as a set of ordered pairs, inputs and outputs, such that no two different ordered pairs are the same first coordinate. Um, a function passes the vertical line test. So remember, if you have a function, um, remember you would graph something like y equals x squared, or, or using function notation, you might, you might say f of x equals x squared. And you may recall that that graphs to be a, a happy little parabola, right? And so, should look a little more symmetric than that, but you get the idea, right? And if it passes the vertical line test, then any vertical line you draw is only going to go through one point, which simply means if you have an x coordinate down here, a first coordinate down here, it's only going to correspond to one height, one y coordinate on the graph. Right? Um, so it, that, that vertical line test goes back to the definition of, of function. So we usually symbolize y as a function of x by y equals f of x. Now a function is one to one, if no two different ordered pairs have the same second coordinate. A one-to-one -one function passes the horizontal line test. So would this happy little parabola pass the horizontal line test? No. No, because any horizontal line, uh, well, it only takes one. A horizontal line down here wouldn't tell you anything. But a horizontal line up here would pass through two points, and that can't happen if it's a one-to-one -one function. So in a one-to-one -one function, you can't have peaks and valleys. So a function that looked like this is also not one-to-one. -one. But that, well, that kind of looks like, you know, our sine function, doesn't it? A little bit, anyway. Or our cosine function. Um, not one-to-one. -one. So sine, cosine, not one-to-one, -one, we stop. We go home, right? No, we make it work. We make it work. We'll talk more about that in a second. So. Um, yeah, we're going to need our functions to be one-to-one, -one, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, note number three it says exactly that. The inverse of a uh, function f is obtained by switching the uh, first and second coordinates in all the ordered pairs that comprise f. The inverse of f is denoted by f inverse. The thing is, we only talk about the inverse of a function f if f is one-to-one. -one. f must be which is why what I was saying a second ago, well, how are we going to find the inverse of a sine function? It's not one to one. Well, again, we'll, we'll fix that in a second. Uh, the domain, and this is a very technical uh, mathematical uh, terminology here, the domain and range of f and f inverse, that's f superscript negative one. It does not mean one over f, it's just a notation. The domain of f and f inverse uh, are flip flops. And that makes sense if you think about it. How we create the inverse is we switch all the x and y. We switch all the x and y's that make up the ordered pairs that make up f. So if we switch all those around, the domain is the set of all x values you're allowed to plug in. The range is the set of all y values you plug in. If you switch all those ordered pairs around to create the inverse, then the domain and range get flip flops. And then here, here's the big property that that we like. If you take a function of a function, so this is function uh, composition, function notation. A function of a composition is function notation. If you take f of f inverse of x, in other words, if you insert f inverse of x into the formula for f, wherever you see an x, you insert the formula for f inverse, say, you get x. They knock f and f inverse, they knock each other out, and you get x. Or other way around, if you insert the formula for f of x into the formula into x uh, in the formula for f inverse, uh, the f inverse and the f they knock each other out. The function composition results in just a formula of x if they're represented if f and f inverse are represented by formulas in the first place. 
If that happens, uh, then uh, these, these two functions are in fact inverses and we use this property to help us solve equations. Let me give you a quick example of something you are already familiar with. If I asked you to solve the equation, say, x squared equals 9, what would you do to both sides of that equation to help you solve that? You kind of think of it like an operation, like doing the same thing to both sides, right? Taking the square root of both sides. And, and that's not inaccurate, but a, um, a way to think of it in terms of inverse functions is you're inserting both sides into the I inverse of the squaring function. So if you think of x squared, the, the exponent here, as the squaring function, then the inverse of squaring is taking square roots. So if you insert both sides of this equation into the square root function, then really what you're doing is you're taking the inverse of the squaring function here. And what happens when you take the square root of x squared? Well, you, you get x. Uh, uh, technically, x has to be non-negative for that to be true, but we won't worry about that detail. And then if you're only interested in the positive root, we're not putting a plus or minus here because that's kind of an extra detail at this point. You just take the positive square root of 9, you get 3. So this gets you a solution, right? It doesn't get you all the solutions when you take the square root of both sides because negative, uh, negative 3 is also a solution. So, but, but you've been using this idea of essentially taking f of f inverse or f inverse of f for a long time since beginning algebra. Whenever you take the square root of both sides of something, you're using an inverse function to solve an equation. So that's exactly what we're going to do here when, well, really, we're going to get to 6.6. .6. The ultimate goal is to use inverse uh, trig functions to help us solve equations, but we won't actually really get to that until 6.6. .6. So we're going to solve equations using similar uh, techniques as to what we did here, inverse functions. So then the question becomes, well, how the heck do we find the inverse of a non-one-to-one -one function? It's pretty important that it's one-to-one -one because uh, if you take the inverse of something that's not one-to-one, -one, it won't be a well-defined function. It won't pass the vertical line test. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. We take one part of the sine of x, but it's got to be one-to-one, -one, so it can't be the normal period. It can't be the one from zero to two, right? Two pi is over here somewhere. So it can't be this one because this is not one-to-one. -one. This, this one cycle is not one-to-one. -one. doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Well, okay, that's uh, depending. On, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but it, 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 it's a it's a good idea. It, it's just got to be one to one, right? Yeah. But the st and and there's not necessarily one way to do it, but the, there is a standard way of doing it. We'll start here, and then here to make sure we get the full height of all the y values of the function, um, the full spread of all the y values. So if we take, if we restrict the domain to make x lie between whatever x value gives you this point on the graph and whatever x value gives you this point on the graph, if we restrict it, the domain, uh, the number, th remember the domain is the set of all first coordinates we're allowed to plug in. If we restrict the domain to lie on this interval, then it will be one to one, right? That, that slice in green would definitely, if you ignore everything else, that slice in green, that graph in green, would pass the horizontal line test. So it would be one-to-one. -one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the sine function and restrict its domain. Well, OK, wh what is this value right here? What is this x value right here that corresponds to this peak? It's got to be pi halves, right? Because this is 2 pi, this is pi, and this is half of pi, so pi halves. And what does this x value have to be? Negative pi halves. So using interval notation, we're going to make the domain d for domain. We're going to make the domain go from negative pi halves, including pi halves, to pi halves. So remember, the brackets mean including the endpoints. So this is saying all first coordinate, in this case, all x values between and including negative pi halves and pi halves. That's the domain. And then you get this graph in green, which is 1 to 1, because it would pass that 
horizontal line test. Any horizontal line would only go through one point. So we make it work. So OK. So how do we come up with the inverse sine? What's the notation that we use? Well, OK. Um, remember from algebra, if you want to, and this, what I'm about to do, I'm just manipulating notation. Um, but I want to try and remind you of what you did in algebra, so that's the reason I'm doing it. Remember in algebra, what you would do to find an inverse function is, if, if the function were defined using a formula, remember you would switch x and y? So we'll do that. So x equals sine of y. Technically, that's the inverse function. But we use a little slightly different notation here. Um, if you recall from algebra, what we do is we solve for the new y. Remember that? So how do we solve for the new y? Well, let's invent some notation. Let's take the sine inverse of both sides. So the notation I'm going to use, I'm going to use sin and then superscript negative 1. And that, by the way, that makes sense with the f inverse notation, right? Because the name of our function here is sin. So I'm, I'm just being consistent with this notation for f inverse. When you see f superscript negative 1, you say f inverse. So now the name of the function is sine. So I'm talking about sine inverse when I write sine superscript negative 1. So what I'm going to do then to solve this for the new y is I'm going to take the sine inverse of both sides. Really what I'm doing is I'm inserting both sides of, this, uh, of the new equation, x equals sine y, into the sine inverse function. Um, just like up here in this example, I inserted both sides of x, equal, x squared equals 9 into the square root function. So similar idea, inserting both sides into the inverse sine function, well, that's fine. On the left, I'm just going to leave that. I'm going to write that as sine inverse of x. And that's going to be our notation for the inverse function. Now, the right side, what should happen? Sine inverse and the sine, when you take sine inverse of sine of y, what should the sine inverse and sine do to each other? They should annihilate each other, and you should be just left with y. Right? And that's according to this property number 5. So that's just playing with notation. I'm just showing you what the notation should look like. So we're calling the inverse sine function in symbols y equals sine superscript negative 1 of x. But we say y equals sine inverse of x. Well, whenever you take a, a function and compose it with its inverse, all you're left with is the thing, the ar what we call it the argument. The thing you're taking the sine of right here is called the argument. So when you take, think of what we had above. When you take f inverse of f of it was x above, all that was left was the x. When you take f inverse of f of x, all that's left is x. That's what inverse functions do. They annihilate each other. And then that's all I'm using here. When you take sine inverse of sine of y, basically you're sticking sine of y into the sine inverse function. The sine inverse, assuming it exists, I guess we're making that assumption, um, and the sine, they should annihilate each other. And you should just be left with this guy, the y. OK? No, because it's not multiplication. Common, very common mistake. But it, we're not talking about multiplication. And by the way, sine inverse does not mean 1 over sine. Now, the reason for the notation is it does something similar as the negative 1 notation that you're used to. What does 2 to the negative 1 mean from algebra? It tr this is truly an exponent here. It does mean 1 half. So look at what happens when I take 2. Really, this is called 2 inverse. It's the multiplicative inverse. Look at what happens when I take 2 inverse times 2 times x. Well, 2 inverse, you already told me, 2 inverse is really 1 half. So I'm really taking 1 half times 2 times x. What's 1 half times 2? It's just 1, right? And 1 times x is just x. So the reason for the notation, the reason for the similarity in notation is because even though the operations are different, this is function composition, this is multiplication, the operations are different, the results are similar. 
in that these guys knock each other out and we're just left with x. These guys knock each other out using function composition, we're just left with y, or whatever letter it happens to be here. So uh, that's what mathematicians do. They look at relationships and not necessarily the specific operations. Um, but it can be very confusing at first. Don't ever think sine superscript negative 1, uh, in the first place, negative 1 is not an exponent, it's a superscript, it's a notational device. Don't ever think that's, that sine to the negative 1 or sine superscript negative 1 is 1 over sine. It's not. Not, not like this is 1 over 2. Okay? So be very careful about that. So here's the notation that we're going to use. It kind of makes sense with the F inverse notation. That's the notation we're going to use for the inverse sine. Now, anytime you're introduced to a new function, you want to know something about its domain, which is the set of all input values, in this case, the set of all x values, because x represents a, a, a generic input value. But if you remember that um, note above, the domain and range of F inverse should be the uh, flip-flop of the domain and range of F. So in this case, the function, if you take a look at y equals sine of x, the domain was negative pi halves to pi halves. What was the range? So look, think low to high. When you're thinking range, think y values. How low does it get? How high does it get? Negative 1 to 1 and all numbers in between, right? This graph takes on all numbers in between, all height values in between, that is. So negative 1 to 1. So th this is the domain and range of sine of x. So the domain and range of sine inverse would be, I'll just switch them, right? So you're allowed to plug in negative 1 to 1 into the sine inverse. That's the domain. So the domain is negative 1 to 1. And the range values would be negative pi halves to pi halves. Okay? Now, we're going to do several examples with sine inverse, but let's do a very similar thing to develop the cosine inverse. So here's the cosine function, obviously not one to one. So the question is, where do we cut it off at to make it one-to-one? -one? We, we force it to be one-to-one. -one. Um, well, the standard way of doing it, not that it's the only way, but the standard way of doing it is starting at x equals 0 and ending at what would the x value of this point be? Have to be, well, the period's 2 pi, right? And this would be half the period. It's got to be pi. So we start at x equals 0 to pi, and then we do get this piece of the graph. If we make the domain 0 to pi and all numbers in between, we get a 1 to 1 function, don't we? So the domain then is a little different, right, than, than it was, uh, than what we cut off for the sine function. The domain is, how would we write it in, in interval notation? What's the lower x value? 0. What's the higher x value? Pi. Are they included? Yeah, so brackets as opposed to parentheses. So the domain is all first coordinate values between 0 and pi. And then the range, how low does it get? How high does it get? Negative 1, and you can't see it there, but it is up to 1. So negative, same, same range as before uh, for the sine function. Okay, so we talk about we, we could do the same sort of derivation symbolically, but it's just symbolic manipulation. So symbolically, we use y equals cosine inverse of x. Older books use arc cosine, A-R-C cosine, to represent the inverse cosine. And same with sine. Arc sine is the inverse uh, sine. So if you come across that notation, you'll know what it means. Um, but modern books use the, the superscript negative 1 notation. Okay, uh, domain. So what, okay, let me go back up here. What should the domain be for the inverse cosine? We, it should be the range of that we've, uh, well, this is the range of the cosine even if we cut off the domain. It should be the range, negative 1 to 1. It should be the range of the cosine. The domain of cosine inverse should be the range of the cosine. And then what would the uh, range of cosine inverse be? 
0 to pi. The range is 0 to pi. OK. Now, I want to talk about a couple of things. It, it turns out that it's really important to memorize what the range of the cosine inverse is. And we'll start up here, the range of the sine inverse. So let me use a slightly different notation and show you a way to help you remember the range. So the fact that the range of the sine inverse, this guy, is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, this is interval notation. If you write it in inequality notation, we're saying the sine inverse of x, you stick it in an x value, the kinds of x values that pop out are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's what we're saying. So how, what's an what's a easy way to remember that? Well, if you think about it, and I'll, I'll prove this to you in a second, but if you think about it really hard, the sine inverse or any trig inverse can be thought of as an angle. And if you don't know why, don't worry. I'll come to it in a second. But if you think about it, the sine inverse can be thought of as an angle, theta call it. So if the sine inverse is an angle, then we can think of this in terms of quadrants that the angle lies in. So let me, let me throw in some coordinate axes here. Just to, well, let me do it over here, just to kind of model it for you. OK, in radians, um, this would be 0 radians if, if the terminal side of the angle coincides with the x-axis, right? If the terminal side coincides with the y-axis, positive y-axis, it's pi halves, pi for the straight angle, 3 pi over 2, 3 quarters of the way around if you're going clockwise. But what if you're not going clockwise? What if you measure the angle counterclockwise, then this is coterminal with negative pi halves, isn't it? Remember, to measure, a, to measure an angle, a negative angle, you you turn from the positive x-axis clockwise. So when, you, when the angle is down here like this, it's negative. All right. So uh, this guy right here is the first quadrant. This guy down here is the fourth quadrant. So any angle in here is any, in other words, any angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 is in the first or fourth quadrant. And that's how it, you can remember it. Turns out, for most people, it's easier to remember that way. So we're saying sine inverse lies in the first or fourth quadrant. If the angle measure is negative, then it's in the fourth quadrant, if the angle measure is positive, the sine inverse is in the, it's an angle in the first quadrant. Okay? Now, the second quadrant is here, and the third quadrant's here. So let's remember that and go down and look at the cosine inverse again. So the fact that the range of the cosine inverse is between 0 and pi over 2 means that the cosine inverse of x in inequality notation lies between 0 and pi. So going back to my picture up here, between 0 and pi would describe an angle somewhere in here. So which two quadrants? First and second, possibly. So cosine inverse, we're saying cosine inverse is an angle. It can be thought of as an angle, theta, in first or second quadrant. And, and knowing these, knowing which quadrant the inverse trig function lies in is critical to solving uh, certain problems properly, okay, to getting the right answers, in other words. Okay. So that's preliminary stuff. We still have to do the inverse tangent, and then I'll show you what the homework's going to look like. Now, just like we did for the sine and cosine to make 
tangent one to one, we've got to cut it off. I think it's a little bit more obvious where to cut it off at. Because it's broken up into pieces, I, I've graphed here multiple periods of the tangent. But it's broken off into pieces according to asymptotes, right? One asymptote looks like it might be uh, in here somewhere. Um, another asymptote here. Whoops, that's too far over, but you get the idea. Then there's, a, there's an infinite number of asymptotes going to the right and going to the left. But this guy in the middle is, is usually the main period of the tangent function, usually the, the period that we graph, right? And by itself, isn't it automatically one-to-one? -one? Yeah. yeah. So this is the one we take, this guy right here. And it's automatically one-to-one. -one. So any, any horizontal line will only pass through one point. Now, do you guys remember the equations of these asymptotes, where they lie horizontally away from the y-axis? Remember where this is at? It's where the tangent is undefined. It's given, it's a vertical line, so it's given by an equation x equals a constant. Do you remember what that constant is? Pi halves for, for this asymptote. And what would this, what would the equation of this asymptote be? So that means this graph that I've highlighted in red here lies between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So for y equals tangent x, we're cutting off the domain. The x values we're allowed to input the domain is going to lie, whoops, I used a bracket by mistake out of habit. You, you never actually get to the asymptote, so we have to use a parenthesis and say that the domain of the tangent lies between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Not including negative pi over 2 or pi over 2, because that, the, that's two places where the tangent's undefined. But any values in between, as close to pi over 2 from the left as you want, any x value as close to pi over negative pi over 2 from the right as you want is included in the domain. What's the range of the tangent function? Range, you think y values. You, go, you can go all the way down, all the way up, and all values in between, right? So yeah, negative infinity to infinity. OK. So now we'll create our notation for the tangent inverse based on um, what we've looked at here. So y equals the tangent inverse of x. As you might expect, we're going to use this sort of notation. Parentheses are optional around the x. Um, what's the domain going to be? Oh, let's go back up and look at our range of the tangent of x. So this negative infinity to infinity all real numbers, in other words, would be the domain of the tangent inverse. We can plug in anything we want. Unlike the sine and cosine inverses, we can plug in anything we want. But then the range is a bit restricted. What's the range? Negative pi halves to pi halves. Now, I didn't actually graph the inverse sine and cosine functions. Uh, you can graph them on a graphing calculator and get an idea of what they look like if you want. Um, but it does turn out to be handy to know the graph of tangent inverse when you go into calculus. So I'll give you a sketch of that graph um, because it's used a lot in Calc 1 and Calc 2. So that graph. Um, when you have vertical asymptotes on the original function, it turns out that when you find the inverse function, you switch all the ordered pairs around uh, to find the inverse, and asymptotes, if they're vertical, become horizontal and vice versa. So these horizontal asymptotes will become, ver uh, uh, sorry, these vertical asymptotes will become horizontal. So you're actually going to have a horizontal asymptote at a height of pi over 2. And when it's a horizontal line, it's described by the equation y equals a constant. In this case, the constant height value, pi over 2. And this lower one would be y equals negative pi over 2. 
So what does the function look like? Well, I don't know if, if you remember this or not. We're not going to dwell on it. But if you reflect uh, the graph of y equals tangent of x across the line y equals x, that's a geometric way of switching all the ordered pairs, it turns out. And it's, so it's a geometric way of getting the inverse function. If you do this, I'll let you examine this on your own. This is just kind of a side note. If you do that, you'll get a function that looks like this. It'll approach the horizontal asymptote as you go to the right and to the left and look like that. So this graph in blue is a, just a kind of a, a quick, very quick sketch of y equals tangent inverse of x. And the only reason I mention it is because you use it a lot in calculus, and it's important to know about these asymptotes so that as you go to the right, the graph gets closer height-wise. The graph gets closer to a height of pi over 2. And as, you, as x goes to the left, or as you travel to the left the, on the function, um, you can think of it as traveling to the left on the function, the height gets closer and closer to negative pi over 2. And that's, that's an important idea for calculus. And you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when you get there. Um, OK. So we've got, in hand, we've got the inverse uh, sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent function. Now let me show you what the homework is going to look like. And we'll talk about the other inverses along the way. But we, we really don't have to think too much in terms of secant inverse, cotangent inverse, and uh, cosecant inverse, because we can always turn it in to uh, one of the other uh, of the first three inverse functions. So if you know the first three, you can get through these problems. And I'll show you how. OK, um, let's take the sine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2. And I'm going to do this kind of the long way to give you an idea of why we can think of this thing as an angle and what is really going on here. But it won't, once you get the hang of it, it won't take you this long to do. Um, so my claim, remember, is that you can always think of a sine inverse, uh, any trig inverse function as an angle. It doesn't necessarily represent an angle, but you can think of it that way. And it's helpful to think of it that way. So I'm going to think of this as theta. In fact, I'm going to write down theta equals sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2. And we're asked to find the exact value of this thing. But you guys know that that's equal to what? Well, OK, let me back up. What could you do to both sides to get rid of the sine inverse? What could you do to both sides? Let me make some room here to get rid of the sine inverse. What could you insert both sides into? The sine function. So I could take the sine of theta, which really I'm, I'm, I'm inserting theta into the sine. I could take the sine of this whole thing, sine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2. Now, on the left, I, I'm just left with uh, sine of theta. I can't do much with that. On the right, what do the sine and inverse sine do to each other? They, yeah, I like the obliterate each other. You can make it exciting. It's an action movie. Well, maybe not, but OK. They knock each other out, and you're left with just what's right here, right? Negative root 3 over 2. So now it tells you what you're really finding. Remember what theta is. Theta is really the sine inverse, right? That's what we call it. So, oh, yeah, because we can write it this way, we're taking the sine of it, we must be able to think of it as an angle. So that's the reasoning there. And furthermore, we've turned it into something you're used to when we write it this way. Um, or you're used to going kind of backwards from this, we're asking you a question. The sine of what angle equals negative radical 3 over 2? Let me do a related question first, and then you'll see how to work this one. So the related, let me, let me lop off this negative just for a second. So this is kind of scratch work, but it's going to give you an idea of how to solve the, uh, how to find theta um, from, the, from the stuff in green right here. So let's lop off that negative, and I'll bet we could come up with the answer to this, because radical 3 over 2 is a special number to go with a special acute angle theta. And I know it's got to be an acute angle because sine inverse is defined in just two quadrants, first and second. Radical 3 over 2 is positive, uh, so it's got to be, so theta's got to be in the first quadrant, 
because the sine of a positive number is positive, the sine of, a of an angle in the fourth quadrant is negative. So I know that theta has to be in the first quadrant, and I remember my chart for the exact values of the sine function, kind of working backwards, what does theta have to be? Okay, let's, let's stick with radians for now, because I think you're going to be in radians quite a bit in this section. So 60 degrees is the same as? Pi over 3. So that if, if the original problem had just been sine inverse of radical 3 over 2, we'd be done. This would be the answer. Okay. Now, it's not. Back to the stuff in green. The sine of theta is negative radical 3 over 2. Now, you're only allowed to be in two quadrants here for the sine inverse, right? Because ultimately, we're talking about the sine inverse. So 1 and 4. So uh, uh, we're looking for the angle whose sine is negative radical 3 over 2. Which quadrant does theta have to be in? Fourth. fourth. That means sine inverse, sine inverse is the angle, is in the fourth quadrant. So what we're really looking for then, if you work backwards, is we're looking for the angle in the fourth quadrant whose reference angle, remember we call the reference angle alpha, whose reference angle is pi thirds. So you can get the reference angle just by, I uh, should have been in green there, just by lopping off the negative and solving the related problem. Get the reference angle. Yeah, the reference angle stuff never goes away. Get the reference angle. The alpha is pi thirds. So what we're really looking for is the angle in the third quadrant whose reference angle is pi thirds. How do you find it? Uh, fourth quadrant, excuse me, fourth quadrant. How do you find it? Well, remember in the fourth quadrant, uh, so theta is going to equal you take 2 pi minus the reference angle. But 2 pi is really what? In terms of thirds, it's really 6 pi over 3, isn't it? If you multiply by 3 over 3, 2 pi by 3 over 3. So what do you get when you take 6 pi thirds minus pi thirds? 5 pi over 3. But that's wrong. I just wanted to review reference angles. All right, it's not wrong, but it's wrong with the uh, particular range that we define for the sine inverse. Because we define the sine inverse to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So, okay, technically we can't use this. And, and I showed it to you this way just so you don't make this mistake. I mean, it, it, you're in the habit of doing it this way. Technically, this uh, doesn't quite work. You don't have any habits yet? No. <laughs> then you haven't done enough. <laughs> then you haven't done enough homework. <laughs> then this doesn't uh, quite work. So how do we make it work? Well, if you wanted to be in the fourth quadrant and have a positive angle, yeah, this would be it, right? But it's actually a lot easier than this. Because instead of doing the reference angle thing, we could just measure uh, a clockwise angle, pi thirds, which would be negative pi thirds. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking it was a good idea at the time. It, it sounded good at the time, but I'm thinking I just should have showed it to you that way um, to begin with. Um, so we know that the angle then has reference angles. So this is probably how I should have shown Sometimes a, an idea in your mind sounds better than in reality. So the reference angle is pi thirds, right? Um, in the, but we know it's in the fourth quadrant. And we know that sine inverse has to lie between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, right? Oh, OK. So if we think of it as measuring a, a negative angle, then it just becomes what? It's still a measure of pi over 3, absolute value-wise, but you just stick a negative in front of it. Does that make sense? OK, so I, I didn't mean to confuse you there. I think that's probably a better way to say it. I'll, maybe I'll edit out that other stuff. OK? So that's it. That's, that's the answer. So we're saying, long story short, that this whole thing is equal to negative pi thirds. OK? Now, what's the good news here? The good news is you can check your answer on the calculator. So 
Check this out. Let's see if I can fit this in my, my window here. Okay. Um, let's make sure you're in uh, radian mode. So make sure this says radians. And then you could just take the sine inverse by going second function, SIN. You see the sine inverse notation. Negative, use the negative button, not the minus. Root 3 divided by 2. And you're going to get a decimal number, right? That's what your calculator does. It's a decimal approximation, so it's not exact. But what should that be close? What should that be close to, or exactly um, equal to, if we lived in an ideal world? It should be negative pi over three. So how could you check it? Just plug in negative pi over three, right? So just go negative. You don't even need the negative, but negative pi divided by three. And although what pops out is an approximation, it should match this to the last digit. So it's a very close approximation. And it does. So you know you're right. So on the first test, you weren't allowed to use your calculator. On this test, you're free to use it, and you can check your answer. Okay? And that will help, believe me. Okay, so um, another way to think of, this is worth mentioning, another way to think of it when you see sine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2, something like that, you can think of it as a question. When you see sine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2, you can think of it as a question. It's asking the sine of what angle is negative radical 3 over 2. In fact, when we write it like this, you can s well, let me move down a little bit. When we write it like this, you can see the question, right? The sine of what angle is negative radical 3 over 2? But you can think of it as asking the same question when, when it's in the inverse sine notation. Okay? So that's a good way to, a good way to think of it also. All right. So let's try another one. Okay. So notice what's different here. Um, it's a secant inverse, which we haven't even talked about yet, of 2 radical 3 divided by 3. Let's use the same technique, and then I'll show you a shortcut for evaluating this. Um, so the idea is I can think of this guy as an angle. In fact, I'm going to write that statement down as an equality. Theta is equal to secant inverse of 2 radical 3 over 3. So the directions are the same. Evaluate this exactly if possible. OK, what could I do to both sides here to put it in the more familiar secant terminology than secant inverse? I'm not familiar with secant inverse at all. But I'm a little bit familiar with secant. So what could I do to both sides to get it in terms of secant? Uh, not, well, not yet. But I could take the secant of both sides, right? And, and essentially, I'm plugging both sides into the inverse uh, function of the secant, inverse. So because these two are inverses, secant of secant inverse, the, what happens on this right side? They knock each other out, and you're just left with this guy, 2 rad 3 over 3, and on this side, secant theta. So the, what's the question that this guy, secant inverse of 2 radical 3, is asking? It's asking you the secant of what angle equals 2 rad 3 over 3. Now, I'm not as familiar with secant as I am with the reciprocal function to secant. What's that? Cosine. So let's now switch to cosine. So here's what I can do. I, I don't want to write 1 over cosine on the left, so I'm going to keep it cosine on the left, but I can flip the right side, can't I? If secant of theta equals 2 radical 3 over 3, then cosine of theta has got to be, be the, reci the reciprocal of that. So 3 over 2 rad 3. But I don't recognize this as a special number, so what could I do with that radical? I could rationalize it by multiplying numerator and denominator by root 3 over 3. Let's see what that does. What does that give me on top? 3 radical 3 and on the bottom? Well, 
it gives me 6 or, well, radical 3 times radical 3 is 3. So I'm going to write it like that so it's pretty apparent what's going to happen there, right? 3 divided by 3. We can do that because the operation is multiplication, not addition or subtraction. So what do we get? Root 3 over 2. Oh, okay. So finding the secant inverse of 2 radical 3 then, if you work backwards, it's the same as finding the cosine inverse of root 3 over 2. So I want you guys to make this connection here. So let me zoom out a little bit so we can get it all in the picture. Okay. So what could you do to go immediately from here to here? Well, essentially, what I'm saying is this, secant inverse of 2 radical 3 over 3 is cosine inverse of the reciprocal of this guy inside, 3 over 2 rad 3. But when you rationalize it, that 3 over 2 rad 3 becomes radical 3 over 2. So a quick way to skip all this stuff, if you want, and just end up down here, cosine, if you want, cosine theta equals radical 3 over 2, is to rewrite, any, you know, in this case, secant inverse as cosine inverse. How do you remember that as cosine? Because the regular secant and cosine functions are reciprocals. That's how you remember it. And then you take the reciprocal of the guy inside. That's essentially what happened. So this, this problem, this statement is the same as this statement. Okay, so I, I'm thinking it would have been better maybe so that it doesn't get in the way of the problem to, um, to not have that there. So um, I'll write it off to the side here. So this is saying that theta is the cosine inverse of radical 3 over 2. Okay, so now back to where we were at. Let me zoom in a little bit so you guys can see what's going on. So back to where we were at. We're, we essentially have the cosine of theta. Remember, theta is the inverse function that we're looking for. The cosine of theta is um, radical 3 over 2. And when I say it's the inverse function, I mean it's the inverse function evaluated at 2 rad 3 over 3. That's what we're looking for. Okay. So now this is something we're familiar with. The cosine of theta equals root 3 over 2. What theta would satisfy that? Now, now what quadrant does it have to be in? First or second, but it's got to be in the first because it's root 3 over 2 is positive. right? That's the reason. So what theta is it going to be in radians? Pi over 6. And that's it. So ultimately, we're saying this, that the secant inverse of 2 rad 3 over 3 is pi 6. OK? So if you could sum up in just a few words what we're doing so far is we're going backwards from what you're used to, aren't we? You're used to taking the cosine of pi over 6 and getting radical 3 over 2. Here you're given the number and you're coming up with the special angle instead of being given the special angle and taking the cosine of it or whatever trig function of it and getting the, the, the number. So you're thinking backwards. Okay. What if I ask you to evaluate the cosine inverse of 2, what would that be? Or what would you tell me? Nope. You would tell me to get lost. Get out of here. Why? Try plugging that in your calculator. Try plugging it in your calculator. If you have a calculator handy, tell me what your calculator says. Cosine inverse of 2. It won't matter if you're in degree or radian mode. Error. Error. Why? Because, yeah, it's a domain error. Look, 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 way back up here, cosine, here we are. Cosine inverse, what's the domain? Negative 1 to negative 1, where is 2? All right, wait, I, did I really write negative 1 there? Oh my gosh, I'll have to edit that out too. Negative 1 to 1, I'm sure I said, and then for some reason my hand didn't do what I said. Okay, so what's the domain? Negative 1 to 1, where is 2? It's outside the domain, to the right of it, isn't it? 
So it's not in the domain, so you get an error. It doesn't, it's not something you're allowed to plug in. So we'll say, um, let's say DNE for does not exist. Uh, and I'll put in parentheses, two is not in the domain. Not in the domain of the cosine inverse function. OK? All right. Next one. We've got the cosine of the sine inverse of 5 over 13. You're asked to evaluate that exactly if possible. Now, believe it or not, this is a problem you're familiar with, but it's in disguise. And you have to put it in terms of, of something you're familiar with. Okay, how can we always think of a sine inverse? We can always think of a, an inverse trig function in general as theta. So we're saying here, I mean, the inside part of this rather is saying theta is the sine inverse of 5 thirteenths. Theta is the sine inverse of 5 thirteenths. Now that's the same as asking what question? I'll start you off. The sine of what angle equals 5 thirteenths? In other words, if you take the, you're going to get sick of showing this work, um, so I'm not going to do it here. But if you take the sine of both sides, you get, don't you get, isn't this the same thing as saying the sine of theta equals 5 thirteenths? Yeah. So this really, sine inverse of 5 thirteenths is a question. It's asking the question, sine of theta equals, or the, I'm sorry, the sine of what angle, I'm calling it theta, equals 5 thirteenths. Well, that's, I mean, that's not something we can answer. It's not going to be an exact number, right? 5 thirteenths is not a special, um, a special number corresponding to a special angle. But it's not all that important either, because what we're really doing is we're taking the cosine of that angle. So this is an old question. It's telling you, it's like from chapter 5. It's asking, it's not telling, it's asking, okay, given that sine of theta is 5 thirteenths, can you find the cosine of theta? Remember that question or that kind of question? What do we draw to help us here? Uh, what do I call it? I call it a, a helper triangle. Now, which quadrant, since we're dealing with sine inverse, which quadrant does it have to be in? Uh, which quadrant does sine inverse have to be in? Whenever this number you're taking the sine inverse of is positive, it's got to be in the first quadrant. Okay, because, yeah, the sine is positive in the second quadrant too, but the sine inverse isn't defined there. Okay, so that limits our options. So um, we know that our helper triangle has to lie in uh, the first quadrant, which means theta, which is the sine inverse, lies in the first quadrant. So theta, which is the sine inverse, lies in the first quadrant. And you, you draw a helper triangle, right triangle like so. We've done it before. And then you label it appropriately. Which side has to be 5 in relation to theta? It's, we're back to Sokotoa, right? It all goes back to Sokotoa. Um, the so part of Sokotoa. Sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. So 5. And then what's the 13? Hypotenuse. The hypotenuse. What would the, now we're, because we're finding cosine, we're going to need what side? the adjacent side. You could use the Pythagorean theorem to find it. Set it equal to x and go x squared plus 5 squared equals 13 squared. But you might remember that, that it's 12. That's, it's called a Pythagorean triple. If you don't believe that, just take 12 squared plus 5 squared and you'll get 13 squared. That, that's 144 plus 25 equals 169. Yeah, that'll work. But if you don't remember that, just use the Pythagorean theorem like you've done in the past. OK, so long story short, the cosine then of theta is going to equal what? A little scratch work over here. Cosine of theta then has to equal adjacent over hypotenuse. That's the ka part of Sokotoa, right? So, uh, so this whole thing right here just equals 12 thirteenths. So let me be clear then. The cosine of theta, which is the sine inverse of 5 thirteenths, that's 12 thirteenths. It's an old problem in disguise. Question. 
All right. Okay, here's uh, maybe an easy one. What do you suppose the sine inverse of pi thirds? Uh, okay, wait, back up, rewind. What do you suppose the sine inverse of the sine of pi thirds is? Pi thirds, and you're right. You're exactly right. So it's pi thirds. They not, just like you saw before, they knock each other out. The sine of the sine inverse, when you plug the sine function into the sine inverse function, they knock each other out, and you're just left with what's right there, usually. Actually, even saying usually is not entirely accurate. Okay, um, based on what we just did, cosine inverse of the cosine of 5 pi over 4 should be? Ah, but it can't be. Let's, let's, put in, let's put in big, bold red, not equal to 5 pi over 4. Why not? What quadrant, if you think of it as an angle, again, it doesn't have to be an angle, but if you think of it as an angle, what quadrant is 5 pi over 4 in? The thir 5 fourths pi is a little bit bigger than pi, right? 1 pi, and, and pi is the straight angle that separates the second from the third quadrant. So 5 fourths pi is going to be in the third quadrant. Cosine inverse is defined in which two quadrants? First and second. So the cosine inverse of something is never going to be an angle in the third quadrant. Can't happen. So how do we do it? Well, we can work this problem from the inside out. We know how to take the cosine of 5 pi over 4. So let's work it from the inside out, like you do with, with function composition, if you remember that from, from algebra. So let's work it from the inside out. Let's, um, let's leave the cosine inverse where it's at. And then on the inside, let's take the cosine of 5 pi over 4. Now the beauty of exact or special angles in radians is you can tell by looking at it what the reference angle is. 5 pi over 4, the reference angle must be pi over 4. But it's in the third quadrant, so the cosine must be what, positive or negative? Negative, negative in the third quadrant, because cosine's positive in first and fourth, right? Um, so uh, it's going to be negative. Cosine of 5 pi over 4 is going to be negative. And then it's going to be the opposite of the cosine of the reference angle, which is pi fourths. Cosine pi fourths is root 2 over 2. So remember what this is. This is a question. The cosine inverse of negative root 2 over 2 is a question. It's asking you the cosine of what angle is equal to negative root 2 over 2. If you need to, write it down. This is really saying it's an angle, right? But, it's, it's, but the question that it asks, or you can think of it as asking this question, is the cosine of what angle, call it theta, equals, question mark, cosine of what angle, well actually, you know where I should put the question mark if I write it that way, I should put it over the angle. The cosine of what angle, theta, is equal to negative radical 2 over 2. That's what this notation is really asking you. Well, we know what the reference angle should be. What should the reference angle be? Pi over 4. But cosine inverse is only defined in first and second quadrant, so it must be in which one? Second, because that's where cosine is negative. Out of, out of the first and second quadrants, cosine is negative in the second quadrant. So what does it have to be? Yeah, if you don't remember, in the second quadrant, remember the reference angle and the angle you're looking for have to add to be pi, the straight angle, right? Or supplementary, in other words. So you would take pi minus the reference angle. And if you get a common denominator, you could think of pi as 4 pi over 4. So 4 pi over 4 pi minus pi over 4 is 3 pi over 4. And so that's what, that's what uh, theta has to be. So theta equals 3 pi over 4. So what we're really saying then, theta is that inverse function. So what we are saying is this whole thing equals 3 pi over 4. Now, do you think you could check that on your calculator? You bet. Yeah, no problem. But again, your calculator is not going to give you exact answers, so you've got to be able to work it out this way. Feel free to check it on your calculator but on a test, but you've got to be able to work it out. So what do you need to show on the test? 
Well, just show, there's not a whole lot to show. Just work this out. Write down cosine of five pi over four. Uh, well, this is the statement of the question rather. So write down that this cosine of five pi over four is is negative radical two over two. Show me that you're working it from the inside out. And then if you want to, you can show me the scratch work. That'd be cool. <coughs> uh, but then at some point, show me the ultimate answer, which is this. Not a whole lot of work to show, which makes it a pain to ask this as a test question because if there's not a lot of work to show, there's not a lot of partial credit to go around, right? <coughs> so um, show something if you're not sure. Work it from the inside out. So how do you know when this sort of thing will happen? How do you know when it's not going to match when you take a, a function inverse times the function, how do you know it's not going to be this thing? In particular, when it's a trig inverse uh, of a trig function, how do you know it's not going to be just, how do you know they're not just going to knock each other out? You got you to look at the domain and realize where the inverse function is defined. Okay, Cosine inverse has to be in the first or second quadrant. If, if you get something that's not in the first or second quadrant, it's not defined. And it only matters when when the inverse function is on the outside and not on the inside, okay? Because that's when that's when you're looking at the output of the cosine function or the inverse trig function is when the outer function is the inverse function, not the inner function. Okay. Any any questions? Yes. Um, how is it that you're going to end up with this Okay. So um, you're okay with. Uh, the fact that this statement is the cosine inverse of negative radical th uh, 2 over 2, that this statement is asking the question, the cosine of what angle is negative root 2 over 2? You're okay there, right? Okay. Then basically you just got to be able to find theta. You know that theta has to be in the second quadrant because the cosine inverse is only defined in the first and second quadrant. This thing is only defined in the first and second quadrant. It's an angle in the first or second. So you know because this is negative, cosine is positive in the first quadrant. So because this is a negative, you know that cosine inverse has to be in the second quadrant. And so really you're asking the cosine of what angle is equal to negative root 2 over 2? Well, if it weren't negative, the reference angle would be pi over 4, which you already knew from our work above. So essentially you're asking um, to find the angle in the second quadrant whose reference angle is pi over 4. And the way you do that is this. If the reference angle is pi over 4 and you know the angle has to be in the second quadrant, you can take pi minus pi over 4 and get 3 pi over 4. And that's, that's the angle. Okay? And that's, that's the stuff that, although it looks a little different, that's the stuff we've been talking about since chapter 5. And that's the stuff you have to really get down to do well in, in the class, right? But this is an opportunity. If you didn't learn it before, it, this is good news. It's an opportunity to, to really get it down now even if you were shaky on it before. Okay. Now, there's plenty of times when we take inverse functions and we're not dealing with special numbers. So just on your calculator, how would you, how would you take the cosine inverse of, or cosecant inverse, rather, of 2.1? Well, first of all, well, okay, uh, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Well, the problem with most calculators is you won't see a cosecant inverse button. Okay, but okay, but it, the sine inverse of what? What is this equal to? This is equal to the sine inverse of, based on what we did earlier, what do you have to do with this guy? Yeah, one over. That's correct. And then just run it through your calculator. So we could take Second function, sine inverse of 1 over 2.1, about 0.496 if you round to three places. And that's, that's as far as we're going to go. So it's pretty easy when it's a calculator question. Okay? All right. Last one. It says find the exact value of the cosine in of the cosine of two sine inverse of root two over two. Find the exact value. Okay. So you, you're taking a test. You have no idea what to do. How can you at least get started here? 
How can you always think of a, a trig inverse function there? What can you think of it as? You can always think of it as an angle. Theta. So another way to think of this is the cosine of 2 times theta, right? Hmm. And also, from, from this bit, we know that theta is equal to sine inverse of radical 2 over 2. And if you take the sine of both sides, if you stick both sides into the sine function, then the sine of theta equals what? So, so this bit tells you the sine of theta is equal to, remember these guys knock each other out? So it's equal to radical 2 over 2. All right? Okay, so let's use this information. This is kind of scratch work, I suppose, but let's use this information. Now, the cosine of 2 theta, hmm, I know the sine of theta. If I were asked to find the cosine of theta, could I find it by using a helper triangle or maybe, maybe something I, maybe since it's a special number, maybe I could avoid that altogether and, and uh, just use what I know about the special angle. But I'm not looking for the cosine of theta. I'm looking for the cosine of 2 theta. Well, don't I have an identity that will turn that into sines and cosines of, of, uh, of just theta? Yeah? So here's my idea. I'm going to take the cosine of 2 theta. Let me make a little bit of room here. And I'm going to write down the appropriate identity that I need. Now, remember there were three different identities for cosine of 2 theta? OK, well, the one I want to use, since I know what sine is equal to, I want to use the one involving sine. Does anybody remember what that is? Yeah. It's the last identity, or I think it's the last identity I've listed in, in uh, I believe it's 6.3. Uh, the last one for cosine of 2 theta, that is. So now, if you think about it, since this thing, since this thing is the cosine of 2 theta, all I have to do is plug uh, the sine of theta in right here. Because remember what this notation means? The sine squared theta means the sine of theta, the whole thing squared. So here's my idea, you guys. What if we... We know what sine of theta equals. What if we just plugged it in right here? And then that would give us a numerical answer, wouldn't it? OK, so that's, that's the technique. So I get that that equals 1 minus uh, 2 times, OK, I'm going to plug in radical 2 over 2. And then i got to square it. OK, well, what's radical 2 over 2 squared? So it's, it's well, when you, s you can square the numerator and denominator, right? So it's the square root of 2 squared is just 2, and the square root of 2, or I'm sorry, the 2 squared is 4. So yeah, it turns out to be one, 2 fourths or 1 half. <laughs> but what is 2 times 1 half? 1. So you end up taking 1 minus 1 and get 0. So this thing that we were given is just 0. And some people get disappointed by that, but 0 is a number. There's nothing wrong with 0. OK? So that one took a little creativity, but here's the how you remember, here's how you can figure out how to use the identity. When you, when you think of the sine inverse as an angle, you recognize, oh, you're just asked to find the cosine of 2 theta. I have an identity for that. And furthermore, I don't know what the cosine of 2 theta is. I don't, know what the, uh, I don't know what the sine of 2 theta is. But I do know from this that the sine of theta is radical 2 over 2. So that if my identity can be written in terms of, or if I can use an identity to write the original in terms of just the sine of a single angle, I'm in. I can make this substitution and compute. That's it.
If you have any questions, stick around. Otherwise, I will see you next time.